It's Thursday, April 4th, 2024. I'm Rim. I'm Scott. And this is Geek Nights. Tonight we are talking about Easter eggs. The correct kind, not the kind you're thinking of. So, uh, you know, my I told the story about on my last ski trip of the year up at Hunter Mountain on the last run of the day, which... Uh, you know, saying that actually is kind of funny because I would have skied more. It was only the last run of the day because my skis exploded, but my skis exploded and I had to like hike down the mountain. So that is relevant because yesterday in the pouring rain, I had to go to REI because I bought my fancy new skis online and I bought. Mm-hmm. No boots in there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> mm. We bought the basically arguably the best television that a normal person can buy if they have enough money, but I won't, there's not really much to say about that right now. We'll save that for a different episode. But yeah, it's the first time in my life that I've, you know, my entire life we've always had, you know, we never bought like bad television, but we just bought a TV. Like we went to Beacon, we just like, we bought a TV, right? We had... Yeah, the, all the previous ones I had, I bought like one that was the right size at a at a good price. I wasn't like investigating like, ah, is is it a high quality screen? How's its color accuracy and such and such? No, never did any of that, right? Because obviously those ones cost insane amounts of money. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. But no, this time I went out and I just, I'm like, ah, I don't like all this smart TV action, but there's not much choice. Uh, I'll just get the best I can get so that, you know, my TV life is, is easier. And, uh, yeah. Ooh. Or it didn't, I don't know. But we went we went to uh. two star, right? And uh, you know, 
It was fancy. Uh, the only it wasn't anything like unexpected, right? But it was, it was, but, it was just, but it was good, I assume. Obvious, yeah. I mean, you know, some dishes were the best dish was the the canard consommé, which was uh, duck soup. Mark's brother. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, basically, it's the same thing as all the other fancy restaurants, where it's like it's not you know not necessarily anything that's like interesting or like oh, again, interesting, but nothing outlandish, yeah. right? It's like unbelievable food you've never heard of. It's just like, oh, it is a duck soup. And you taste the soup mm. and it's like, wow, that is, you know, not necessarily an unfamiliar flavor, but somehow it is extremely powerful. <laughs> right? It's like, there'll be like a tiny piece of asparagus, right? And you eat it. And it's like, did they just extract like all the asparagus flavor from like an entire farm of asparagus? It's <laughs> like one drop and put it onto this tiny sliver of asparagus <laughs> it's like this here's some asparagus soup in a thimble <laughs> and it's like you you take one spoon of it and it's like that feels like a, a taste like a shit ton of asparagus but it's just a small amount of liquid probably just asparagus flavor and melted butter <laughs> um but the other thing that was comical was that is that this, you know it was uh for dinner we got i think it was four courses and the fourth one was dessert right and you choose the first three there's three pages on the menu you choose one thing from each page and then you get dessert mm -hmm. and the the dessert we ordered came out and then there was some like free extra like fresh madeleines they made it was the second Ooh, dessert I'm a fan and of then that. we're sitting there we're like all right that's we're, we're good now and then they come out with a little uh Petty four. <laughs> it's like yeah. that's like the third dessert. At that third dessert is beyond what even a hobbit would expect. Right. And so we're like, all right, that third dessert, that we, we must be done here, but they have not brought the check yet. Right? <laughs> and they have not taken away this plate. They come and they take away the third dessert plate. And then a guy comes over with a tray of assorted chocolate sticks. Mm. And you can select one of four sticks. So it was a fourth dessert. <laughs> And then after the fourth dessert, you ate one chocolate stick right, of your choosing. And then they came with little, uh, like, tiny cakes in bags. And they're like, here's cake for when you get home, the fifth dessert. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, this place is going wild with the dessert. That's that that extra dessert in a, in, a, in a box or a bag, I have encountered. I've never encountered that in the U.S., but I've encountered it many many times in my european travels for work where we eat it like not michelin star two mm -hmm. places but like well, very expensive places well i haven't eaten at any place this fancy in like a year i ate a i like think i ate that one star last year <laughs> at some point and they didn't give a fifth dessert in a bag they gave breakfast for tomorrow they're like here's breakfast for tomorrow to take home uh, <laughs> three star is just like Sarah's uh, crack pipe for the evening. Yeah, if I go to if I go to the three star, are they gonna give me ten desserts? Like, <laughs> they are they gonna give me like a pre a pre dessert and then? A... Yeah, they move away from dessert. You just get a small piece of high grade silver, like a little ingot to take home. Mm, I don't know. Oh yeah, here's, here's a refund and uh, <laughs> half the value of what you just gave us in cash in gold. <laughs> you paid so much, we can give you a lot of it back, and we still made a lot of money, my good man. Okay. <laughs> so you got any news? Uh, yeah. So usually, high-profile peoples, right? You know, executives, CEOs, yep. billionaires, politicians, right? Uh, any, you know, important people who are, who have things, you know, that we want to hear them say or not say will be very, very careful in when and where they speak to whom about what, etc. Right. In other countries, even more careful than in the U S I know yeah. that like a lot of, especially like, you know, <clears throat> Japan, Korea, right. We've had experience interviewing Japanese, uh, minor medium celebrities. And it's like, the questions are all approved ahead of time. They prepare their answers ahead of time. The interview is merely just a performance of something that has already been written, right? Yeah. You're not really, they, you know, they're not, they're upset if you say anything else that was not planned uh, in <laughs> advance. Right. In the U.S., not as much uh, so scripted as that, right? But, you know, if you were even like, 
you know, like in a press pool, like, you know, at a press conference, they might not take your question because they yep. know they don't like you. They'll ignore right? you. They, know they, might, you they might kick you out of the next one. Yeah, they're not going to give you a real answer if you, right? Or they're going to try to prevent you from asking in the first place. Um, and if it's, you know, an interview, it's like, you know, am I going to do an interview with that person? No, that person hates me. I'm not going to do an interview with them because they're going to run me over. Yep. It's like, ah, this person's going to toss off softballs. It's just Letterman or some shit. I'll go on that show, right? He's just going to hype me up. Now, this is why some me, of the most powerful moments that can happen in America with important people who have power is when either <clears throat> they expect a live thing to be softballs and it's not, which is super rare, or when they agree to what Scott's news is. Yeah. So what happened <laughs> is there is a person uh, who I don't really don't want to mispronounce their name, uh, Olayemi Olurin, who is a former defense lawyer for the Legal Aid Society uh, and is generally an extremely leftist person on issues, <clears throat> especially of, you know, social justice, yep. crime, etc. who probably 99 or 110% agree with whatever they have to say. Um, and this person, you know, despite being far to the left, is very much a critic of the mayor of New York because everyone is, right? The people on the right hate the mayor of New York because he's a Democrat. He's not a right-wing nut job, right? Yeah. He's not a MAGA dude, right? He's not that kind of evil. Uh, but people on the left hate him also because he's a cop. Right? Yep. And uh, he's, he's been a mixed bag as a mayor. He's done some good things. He's done some shitty things. No. The number of mayors of New York who are not both hated and mediocre is vanishingly small in the entire history of this city. Mayor of New York is basically, you're, you're hated even if you're, right, like, no matter what, right? You think of, like, the good mayors of New York, right, still have things you couldn't criticize them about. But really, if you ask any anyone who, like, who is a good mayor of New York, you might get some right-wing nut job saying Giuliani. Yep. Right? You might get... Some, you know, middling middle people or weird people who really liked your boss for some reason. Right? <laughs> um, <laughs> there are people who do say that. On that the is true. There are not many, but they are out there. I, um, I have no but, formal comments. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the majority of people, though, I think if you ask them, like, who is a mayor of New York that didn't suck? Right. Our only the only names you ever hear are like uh, Dukakis and LaGuardia. Right. Yep. And even they were flawed in many ways um but anyway i mean well ask someone hey tell who's a mayor of new york who sucked new yorkers will like have someone already on All the tip of, of their tongue and it doesn't matter if you ask a republican or a de or the farthest nazi or <laughs> a commie or an anarchist right they're, they're which mayors sucked they will name mayors on both sides <laughs> upsides downsides <laughs> you don't want to be mayor of new york notice nope. that the mayor of new york never really goes on to greatness afterwards, right? That doesn't happen because you just, you get there and then you're a hated, reviled individual who can't go anywhere else. The right? best the, case the, scenario for you is when you're no longer mayor, no one talks about you again. Yeah, it's like the last guy, he was mayor for, you know, he got reelected as mayor despite criticism all over the place. And he also did good and bad things, right, de Blasio. But as soon as he tried to like run for president, it was like a laughing stock, like, right? <laughs> it's like, you can't do that, right? Uh, but anyway. So, uh, what was her name? Uh, Ola Yemi uh, got a call to appear on this radio show, which is called The Breakfast Club. Nothing to do with the movie, um, at least that I'm aware of. <laughs> it's a very popular show, right? It's, it's a local radio show, but it's basically nationally syndicated on BET because it's, right, it's targeting an audience of black people, um, which is why, you know, white people probably don't know about the show. Uh, but you know, the mayor is also a black dude, right? So it's appropriate for him to appear on this show. I don't know if he's been on it before, right? But somehow, uh, this person, Ole Emmy, who is a s extremely strong critic of the mayor from the left, right? Was going to appear on this show. Uh, and she's like, I, right, I'll be on that show, right? That'll be great. Yeah. People hear me. All it's a really popular show. And then they're like, yo, mayor's going to be on with you. And she's like, what? You got it. You know, you're you're lying. That's you. There was no way he would agree to that. Yeah. How is this even happening? Right. And, but, but obviously it happened. Like, that's what we're talking about. Right. She was expecting she'd show up to talk about the mayor, like spend her time on the show criticizing the mayor and that he would be a topic of conversation. 
but not that the mayor would be there, right? If you're the mayor, you don't need to appear with someone on a show. You're the mayor of New York. You appear by yourself, yep. right? You, it's just you and the host. You don't go on. You don't need like an extra person to like, you know, get the ratings up or to have anything else to talk about, right? You are the mayor of New York. You appear alone, right? Um, but somehow, I don't know if the mayor's press secretary or who's responsible for this or whatever, but uh, at least, you know, from our perspective, this is amazing. But from the mayor's perspective, someone fucked the fuck up, right? Yeah, like, the, 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 didn't the strategist, like, already release a statement, like, he shouldn't have got on the show? Like, there was a whole, this is still, like, an evolving kind of crisis for this dude. Yeah, well, I mean, he's his whole time has been a crisis. Oh, but yeah. Regardless, probably. sure enough, the show happened, and you can see clips from it uh, or listen to it easily if so you, you know go on when, the internet. when there's a hockey game between, like, two teams that, like, really have a history and, like... You just know coming in, like, yeah, there's going to be some fun. Like, it's going to be crazy. And then you get there, and it's exactly what you thought. I, I've, I've, I haven't watched, listened to this whole thing, but I, from what I've seen, yeah, this is exactly what you think it was. Like, it was yeah. not cordial. It went yeah, hard. I mean, this, this dude was getting ripped a new one big time, yep. right? Uh, by someone who had, you know, some, one person showed up with, you know, was prepared, receipts, right? It was basically their whole job is criticizing this one dude. Yep. Right? And they're a lawyer. <laughs> now, I right? do, I would. Like, and on the one mayor hand, is, you know, some guy. I do have a certain amount of respect, even for someone I might hate or disagree with in an extreme fashion, if they will own what they're all about and, like, show up in an adversarial context like this to, like, face the receipts. Yeah, no, but no, but he was just but like, he clearly, you know, he, like, this was clearly a fuck up. Like this, this was right, a he mistake. showed up, but he wasn't facing the receipts. He was like, no, 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 your facts are wrong. And it's like, no, they're not. Bro, yep. right? And, and they're just, absolutely right? not. That's that's very clear yeah. from the follow ups right. to this. It's like, you know, if he would have showed up and been like, yeah, you're right. I have fucked up. I'll do better. It's like, all right, yeah, there we go. I could respect, you know, but it's like you, you just appearing is not enough to get the respect. Mm -hmm. You have to appear with the the right way, right? And just sitting there and getting absolutely destroyed and admitting no wrong is not the not the way to get the respect, right? Yeah. It's like you get invited to the dunk or tank at least, and you don't know what a dunk or tank at least, is. Even if you're not going to admit wrong, you need to come back with something better, right? Yeah. And he didn't have anything. It's gotta bring your own receipts, gotta gotta have something. You can't right. just you can't just say the receipts. If you aren't put true. up a legit fight in good faith, right? That was sincere and and right then it's like all yeah. right i can respect that he went into to battle his harshest critic right with but it's like no he just went and got his ass handed to him but you know pretended that he didn't and that's that doesn't count so as a total aside because this is great like you should you should check out all these clips if you want to know the deal with new york politics uh, the, the quote i think that my favorite quote right was uh let me find it i had it written down <laughs> there's a lot of really quotable moments so far Uh, uh oh you can't have it both ways is this the safest city in america yes or is this a dangerous hellscape that needs more police which one is it because the mayor <laughs> says both right the mayor is like it's the safest city in america which is true that is a fact yep or is it a dangerous hellscape that needs more police not true but the mayor often is like oh we need more police in the subway it's like uh, you know it's like uh well, you just said it was the safest city, which is true. You're not wrong about that. Yep. Why are you then supporting all this boosting of the police unnecessarily? And you're only and then not answer... even getting into the fact that police don't increase safety, which is an entirely separate discussion. Yep. Ah. <sighs> So a total aside, before we get into the other news, the thing we talked about right before the show happened three times during this segment. Okay. The cutout. And it seems to happen when you get loud because you're animated and then you back off a little bit. Uh-huh. Anyway, uh, let the listener uh, take a guess at what that's about. But uh, so I got a little news. This isn't this isn't news in that anyone who's even like remotely paid attention slightly to anything that's been happening for the last decade would feel. But it is some it's a statistic that is growing that is sort of really underpinning that we as a society, in America at least, uh, I'm not even going to get into the rest of the world, which also not great right now. Things are not going well, but this is a very specific one. 
Uh, seven in ten adults in America are stressed about money. Seventy percent. So seventy percent of all the adults you meet, encounter, know in your life are stressed about money to the point that it's impacting their lives. Mm -hmm. And I think we're all feeling this, like layoffs, capitalism. Even like, people who have a lot of money, right? It's like, you know, should I really be stressed about money? Not really. I just, I got, I'm fortunate, very fortunate. Yeah. I just bought a fancy TV and my bank account still yeah. has a big number like, on Like it. you and I, like our, like we're, we're people who worst case scenario, if things went really bad, cheapening our lifestyle and using our savings, like we'd survive. There's the universe I where guess, we can't yes. eat is almost zero. Right. The thing that worries me though, is the rent, right? The rent mm -hmm. is high here and I don't want to leave. Yep. <laughs> so yeah, I, I really need, if I hit the backup plan of, well, I can survive, but I have to live literally anywhere but New York City. I'm extremely uncomfortable with that. Yeah, so it's like I won't be in money trouble, but right. The other thing that concerns me is like, yes, I have. I'm very fortunate right now. I've been fortunate for a long time that basically anytime I've lost a job, I've been able to change or get a new job easily. Yep. But there are a lot of layoffs going on in the industry. Yep. Uh, I don't currently have, you know, AI machine learning skills because yep. I'm bad at math. Nor do, nor, um, do I, nor do I. I'm working on a project, but it's a very small long-term project. Right. Uh, I am getting recruiter emails still, but much less frequently also, than I also was. Also much more, less frequently, but also a more was, worrying statistic. I'm getting right. a lot more people I've worked with, like in my long career, because... I realized I've been being, I've been a product manager in capital markets for 17 years, and that just is a terrifying number. Uh, people have been contacting me in the last six months, basically saying, basically saying like, "Hey, you hiring? You know anybody who is?" And I have not had people reach out to me like that frequently in my entire life. And I think more people have reached out to me with questions like that in the last six months than the rest of my life combined. Hmm. Uh, and the other thing is that I'm at a job now and, you know, the company is, is surviving, right? Mm -hmm. But it's like, uh, and my job is, you know, extremely generous, but, uh, if I lose this job or if the company goes under, cause it is a startup-y place, it's yep. not super stable. Like the other places I've been, right. It's still had, there's always a risk, uh, no matter how low or right. There's never zero risk. Uh, anything can happen at any time. Yep. And if something happens, it's like, yeah, I got savings. I can go, right? Um, I, if I have to, I could, you know, dip into, you know, longer term savings. If, you know, I could even pay 401k penalties if I was truly desperate, right? But, you know, really don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah, but also like you and I, like you pointed about the privilege thing, we're, we're in the upper percents just by the, the extreme wealth disparities in America and the world. Like most of the people I know in the world like the people i am friends with and care about don't have enough money to retire like at all no. like no nobody can afford to retire i am worried about being able to retire and i have probably the best shot of a good retirement of almost anyone we know and i'm worried about the future of that yeah it's like you know i got more money in my 401k than most people i'm like way ahead of what other people have yep but it's like, then you look at like, well, what it's going to cost to live numbers wise. Yeah. The calculator you know, still tells me, yeah, you're not in great shape. Despite the amount of money being ludicrous compared to what most people could ever save. Right. It's like, I'd have, you know, it's like, sure. I'll have money when I retire, but you know, if, when, if I yep. live that long, right. That's the first goal, right. I just live that long. <laughs> it doesn't do, um, but it's like, yeah, you're, you're going to have, you know, if social security still exists, plus that savings, you know, plus if you do some old timey man job, you know, for whatever you can do, um, you know, just a part timey old person job because yep. you're retired, you're not doing a real job. But those uh, are if you do, if you do too supply. much real job, they stop giving you Social Security, right? Yeah, but even yeah. worse, I, I there's another article uh, I was reading this morning on the train talking about how could like the low key retirement jobs that a lot of old people would take to supplement their income, they're all disappearing because young people are so desperate they're taking those kinds of jobs and mm -hmm. old people are just, they got nothing now. Like they yeah, don't even have the option of working because no one will hire them. Yeah. Regardless, uh, you know, that would only be like the smallest part, right? Yep. Uh, it's just like a very low wage job that you only do a few hours a week, right? Way less than 40. So <laughs> it's not bringing in that much, even if you get one, it's like, will that be enough to pay for 
a New York City apartment and all this shit. No, no, no. It won't. I had to go. I had to go live somewhere cheap and you know I'd seriously downgrade. You know my cost of living. Yeah, well, uh, you'll have to live in a town at that is at least two towns away from a town that has a train. Yeah, who knows where? Right. We'll see what we'll see what the world is like. Yep. And broadly, I don't know what to do about. Like, I already vote for Democrats. Like, that's not enough. <laughs> You know, there's some things that it's like, yeah, you know, you got to fight for what you can fight for and do what you can do. But yep. certain things are just like the sun rising, right? It's like you can't at least individually do anything about it. You engage in your collective action that you can engage in with in your means and abilities yep. and capabilities. And beyond that is you, you know, you can't control other people so much and that's just what the world is going to be. Yep. It's no different, even though, you know, it's, it's frustrating because it's like people did that. It wasn't like a natural disaster, like an earthquake, nothing you could do about it. Yeah. But it's but, people in this weird abstract sense, because the societal structures like companies and political parties and all these things that are comprised of people, they get complex enough to where they will take actions that no one person within that entity would necessarily have taken but they will take them on their own due to their own bureaucratic inertia. Like that's a thing that happens. That's actually a thing that I've gotten training on in terms of, you know, like management and stuff like that's, that's uh, a, yeah. and so, a, right. So even though they're not natural disasters, you sort of just have, you know, my philosophy at least is that you just sort of have to live as if they are, yep. be mad at them, be upset, fight against them. Of course, no matter if they're terrible, right. Fight for them if they're good. But in the end, Right, you're gonna live this one life. You're not gonna be able to change certain things. Other people live their whole lives, right? Everyone who's lived their life up until this point, every single person has dealt with shit their whole life. Yeah. And it there there wasn't a utopia by the time they died. No, not one person yet. Not the great Caesar, not the the poorest, saddest person, right? Not the the copper guy. I mean, people people lived in peasant servitude in Europe longer than all the technology we use today that uses electricity has existed. Yeah. So, but yeah, that's it. That's just depressing news. Cause I'm thinking about it a lot and not sure what to do about it. Uh, anyway, you just do, you do what you can. You live your life. Be glad. Be very glad. Yep. If you're listening to a I, podcast, you are definitely better off. A hundred percent of the people listening to this are better off than medieval peasants yep. by a lot. The best so, thing I could say is what one thing you can do in the very least is talk about this more just broadly because we need a higher percentage of people in society to at least openly recognize this slow motion disaster that's happening, even if they can't do anything about it. Because this is there's a theory of bureaucracy, and I don't want to derail because we got to do the whole main bit and everything, but uh, I was reading a lot of essays lately, and it boils down to... The first step to solving a big problem is just getting the smallest majority, the narrowest majority of the people who exist in the space where that problem is to recognize it's actually a problem and to agree and talk about that it's a problem. That doesn't solve it. That, that doesn't even get you 1% of the way to solving it, but it's the first step toward mm -hmm. anything happening. Because if you can't even get a majority of people to agree it's a problem and say it's a problem, what fucking chance do you have of doing anything about it unless you're a superhero or a billionaire? Right. And I guess the other thing is that no matter how bad shit is, even if we're all reduced, to me let's say we're all reduced to medieval peasantry tomorrow by some great disaster, right? You can still have comfort knowing you're not alone. You're yep. not the only person who's being subjected to medieval peasantry. We are all peasanting together, yep. right? And maybe that's and so, where then we unionize together, and then the right, barricades we can, we form, do, and things get weird. Right. We can do things. Right, uh, the rest of us are also here, right? Uh, living through the same disaster. You know, would you? It's like it's one thing to be in a in a zombie apocalypse by yourself. Yep. But it's like you know what? You know, it's like even if there's a zombie apocalypse, it's like if I got a group of 10 people and none of them are the, the crazy guy who's going to get bit by zombies on purpose or something. <laughs> or not tell or anyone that they got bit by a zombie. Right. As long as no one's the crazy guy who's going to ruin it, right? It's like, you know, 
that's that's something I can hold on to. Oh, but all this reminds me of again. So we're I'm watching that Wheel of Time series because I read the, all those books to the end, and I you was did. reminded because we just watched the scene where remember when the one stupid kid, they're in this super evil place like the worst Mordor. Like imagine if Mordor was there, but then there's like oh the, the pla- worst the place Mordor. in the far north that the, place. Uh yeah, well the place where with the cursed dagger and all the nonsense, where even like the evil dark magic won't go. Like the Trollocs won't go there. And okay, the wizard, I barely remember. Well, okay. the wizard woman is like, listen, you kids, whatever the fuck you do, do not fucking touch anything while we're here. And the first thing that kid does is find a cursed looking dagger and take it and hide it oh, and right, not right, tell right, anyone right, about right, yeah. it. Yeah, and, I remember. And the yeah. show, when he finds the dagger and he picks it up, it looks so cursed. It was almost funny. Comically cursed. It was comically cursed. Good. Oh, I remember that. And then he's like, he's like, God, all tr-. he's like, he's he's the one who's dealing with bullshit all the time because yep. he's cursed. <laughs> yeah. All right, let me move the little marker for the tings of the day. But anyway, things of the day. This is a 16 second video, but I learned something from it. There's an old Bugs Bunny cartoon where Bugs Bunny does a thing. But before he does the thing, he says, I saw this once in a toothpaste commercial. And it's like a throwaway joke. Like, there's there's no possible way as a kid, as an adult, I ever had any context for that. But it turns out that was a pop culture reference to a commercial that was contemporary to that Bugs Bunny cartoon. And this YouTube video just shows you that commercial and then that Bugs Bunny scene. And I learned something. And you'll learn yeah. something too. I mean, that is the Looney Tunes in general, old Warner Brothers cartoons are mostly timeless in yeah. their humor. Well, right? case in you, point, you, you don't need to know who Peter Laurie was, but you'll recognize that character and find it funny what, when it would appears. Would people younger than us really recognize, or would they just be like, you know, would, that that that's you know, Bugs? Would they know that Bugs Bunny? Yeah, <laughs> is pretending. To be Groucho Marx. I mean, the same way. How many how many people? You're just pretending to be funny guy with mustache and a cigar. How many people know we don't need no stinking badges from The Simpsons? Right. So, um, or how many people don't even know we don't need no stinking badges at all? (laughs) Uh, Regardless, right? There were some jokes that were in old (laughs) cartoons that weren't timeless, and you may or may not get them without knowledge. But I think the magic is. The most timeless jokes that are pop culture references are the ones that are equally funny if you know what they're referencing or you don't know what they're referencing, which is kind of relevant to Easter eggs. That is the key, I think, is like if you're going, you know, you ideally, if you're making jokes, you want to make timeless ones. Mm -hmm. If you have to make a non-timeless joke, you just have to make it in such a way that it lands, right? (laughs) Even if someone doesn't know anything, it'll still be funny in perhaps a different way or some way, right? Um Anyway, so I had a 16 uh, second YouTube uh, thing of the day. You have an hour and 41 minute thing of the day. That's right. So we <laughs> love to do thing of the day when we find a movie that is normally not easy to see because it is, you know, not available by legal means in the United States in English, et cetera, uh, readily. Right. You won't see this on Netflix. I don't think you know, I think you will see something with the same title on Netflix. That is a different movie entirely <laughs> or a TV show. I don't even know. Um, but it is well known among the nerds that Resident Evil was greatly inspired by something called Sweet Home. And Sweet Home was like this old NES game that was Japanese only, but you can play a translation of it. Yep. I honestly can... recommend watch a long play of it. Like it's you've got to be a very particular kind of person to enjoy playing it. Yeah, it's it's an old NES game, right? Um but uh Sweet Home, the video game. Was I don't know. Was it based on the movie? I pre- or vice? I'm pretty sure. It was I actually based don't. On the movie. I actually don't know. I would have to look that up in Wikipedia, and I'm not willing. It could to right be now. that the movie was based on the game, but I don't think that's correct. Could be wrong. Anyway, yeah. I'll try to that look it up movie, while you talk. Sweet Home from 1989, full <laughs> film, subbed is on YouTube for free to watch. Uh, I don't know if this is legally on YouTube. But it's there to watch. <laughs> and ah, the video uh, game is based should. on the movie of the same name from the same year. So I was correct. Yes. Uh, but yeah, this movie was very popular and influential. And if you like, I don't consider myself to be like a Resident Evil fan. Um, but I've played 
and beaten all of them except maybe the most recent one i was two? playing through four again not that long ago i just had this urge and was just playing beaten it. four twice uh, <laughs> i think i watched you beat four the first time you beat it yeah that was on the gamecube but yeah then I, right um but yeah it's like they're the kind of games like i play I, I play once i beat it and i'm done i don't go back and do it again and find all the other endings and characters and i don't do that right? yeah it's like i just play them once done uh, so I'm missing, you know, I'm not deep into it. I just, you know, they take a couple days or so, and then you're good. All right. In the meta moment, the Geek Nights Book Club book, Night is Short, Walk On Girl. Within a few weeks, we're going to do the episode. The book is short. You can read it pretty quickly. Uh, yep. It's pretty good. Yeah. I want to read. I'm going to try to finish reading it because I want to move on to some other <laughs> motivated to read a different thing. Yep. So. Yep. Uh, well, I just because I want to read the, uh, the new Emily Wilson translation that I haven't yet. I want to read the conclusion of uh, the city we become. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I got a bunch of essays. I, I got those. Queued up. I also got those. Yep. Yep. There's a lot mm -hmm. of reading I want to do. Uh, I've just been busy, but I got a bunch of travel because uh, we are at Emily and I are heading up to hopefully watch the eclipse uh, this weekend. Unless Hope it's cloudy. Indirectly. <laughs> yep. I got, I've got glasses that are legit. Thankfully. So what? So we can't see the eclipse from New York City, is that correct? That is. So it, you'll see a little bit of it, but it is a, it is a, one of the absolutely rare, complete and total eclipses, and it goes right over Racha Cha, like right yeah. over. That's not that far away. That's no, a very that's why small we're going. That's why we're doing it. We're driving out to Emily's house for the weekend. But I'm saying, like, I'm. So you'd think that, like, if the moon gets in the way of the sun, that a much larger area of the earth would be in the shadow. But the moon but is so little that the band of a total eclipse, where yep. if you are in that band, the sun will absolutely be invisible for a brief moment. That band is not that wide, but you know what it covers? Henrietta and Rochester. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I would be more motivated if I hadn't already seen some total solar eclipse or two. I've right. never seen a total solar eclipse in person before. Uh, it was the one that was in. I remember I was in Manhattan. That was one. The one in Manhattan was not wasn't total. The one I, that total. I remember okay, seeing back only, when I worked at Flyer. Only mostly eclipse. Yeah, but it wasn't total. Total is different. Some some special things happen if you are within the totality zone of an eclipse. But the one in Manhattan was pretty deep. I I remember was, it was a, it was eclipse enough for me. It's like okay, yeah. I mean, I, it's like if you think about it. Right, if you just walk under a tree and then walk out from under the tree, that's like an eclipse simulator. Right? <laughs> it's like you're in the. It's what does it matter if the moon is casting a shadow on you or if the sun, if the a tree is casting a shadow on you? You're just having a shadow. You're something well, is between you and the well, sun. Here's the, di the difference is the the shadow is big enough to where there is no ambient light reflecting from areas outside of the shadow within the horizon. Mm -hmm. Hopefully it won't be cloudy, but we have glasses that I am confident we can look at the sun without going blind with. Because mm -hmm. we bought them from something that was linked to directly from SciShow, like Hank Green, like those people. All right, that seems trustworthy. That's, that's, if, that, if I can't trust that, society's fucked. Like, at that point, there's I mean, nothing left. Personally, I really, no matter what fancy equipment I had, I really wouldn't even be that interested in looking at the eclipse directly it's like first of all the box method's good enough for me but second of all in the total eclipse scenario just looking around at the darkness would yep. i think actually be more impactful than looking I've at heard tell, a circle with a black disc in front of it right? i watched like, some okay. videos of previous solar eclipses from different places and in a lot of places apparently all the birds just go fucking nuts which mm. makes sense because birds yeah you know they're outside that like when there was the, when there was the eclipse in Manhattan, you know, I mostly was just looking at the other people who yep. were, you know, using glasses and looking up at the sky. That was much more interesting. <laughs> what was fascinating though is I remember the one in Manhattan because there were a lot of people I encountered out in the street who literally had no idea there was going to be an eclipse and were like, "Why is everyone out? What's going on?" Like those are the people who don't read and, and watch news. We talk about those people all the time. Yep, those are we're not the, the we're the opposite of those people. Those are the not the people who are going to vote effectively or help us deal with the coming apocalypse. No. <laughs> all right, so Easter eggs. Uh, we're not talking about the past kind. We're talking Although about the if Easter was very recent, the holiday. Yeah, a little so it's bait and switch. I guess. I'm confident there's a chance someone will expect we're going to talk about 
egg Easter eggs. But now we're talking about Easter eggs like the first Easter egg, which if you didn't know, it's actually the Atari video game adventure includes the oh, first. Oh, really? That's the first one? That's oh. the first one that was called an At Easter least in egg. software or is it first Anywhere. one period? It's the first time. Anyone... I don't know about that. I, I don't think so. We, well, the first on. time it was publicly released, the first known Easter egg, I just pulled up the Wikipedia to confirm, mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. in a 1973 video game, Moonlander. Okay, if let, you me, check and, let me check and see something. Horizontally, you encounter a McDonald's restaurant, according to Wikipedia that I just opened a second ago. Okay. The term was coined in 1979 by Steve Wright, and the ter term was applied in 1980 when 1980 appears to be the first time an Easter egg that nobody knew about except the person who put it in the game was discovered after the fact. And apparently, uh, I just learned something I didn't know, according to Wikipedia, it was a big deal because that was before video game developers for Atari were allowed to have credits for their games. It was some anti-union, anti-unionization biz to make sure they couldn't uh, negotiate for better salaries. So Warren Robin Fett just fucking put his name in a secret room in Adventure, and then someone found it, and Atari was like, oh shit, we gotta like recall the game, and then they gave up because they realized that was impossible, and it was a whole thing. All right, so what year did you claim this first? So uh, Wikipedia, the first one ever, Wikipedia claims 1973. Oh, what when in 1973? Uh, I don't know. I'll have to click deeper. The game Moonlander. Okay, okay. So it could it, it might be correct in that it defeated this, which I is I February believe February 25th, 1973, the game was dead okay. complete. Okay. You have beaten what I believed to be an, an earlier Easter egg by 10 months, mm. right? On December 7th, 1973, in the United Kingdom, Monty Python released a vinyl album. Oh, the third track. Did they call the, it the, an Easter egg, though? The, the matching tie and handkerchief. <laughs> and if you don't know, on this vinyl album, right, what they did is it was a three-sided album. So on one side of the album, you would put the needle in the groove and it would play. On the other side of the album, there were actually like double grooves. So yeah, like two you, interlocked spirals. Yes. So if you put the needle into one groove, it played side B. And if you put the needle in the other groove, it was like, you, you'd be like, wait a minute. Right. It's like you, you, by accident, you would just hit the other groove and it would play something completely different. It was a three-sided record. Yeah, something completely different, eh? Right. That's right. A hidden track, effectively, and an entire hidden side to the entire album, right? Content that you didn't know was there, right? Which is, I, I, I argue, the exact definition of an Easter egg, right? There is you, there is you were getting some sort of artwork yep. or some form of media, right? And there is something in it that you were not aware of that required some secreting or some digging yep. or but, something. But uh, I think it's key that it is intentionally uncover. there. Yes. Now, I think that I think part of the difference too is the difference between what an Easter egg is versus when people started calling this concept an Easter egg specifically. Because mm. there are Just definitely someone doesn't call it an Easter egg doesn't mean it's not an Easter egg. Exactly. I mean, I think so. Like certain uh, hidden images in old tapestries, like the, like those are Easter eggs. Mm. I think humans have lo have had the concept of Easter eggs and loved it and done it for as long as humans have made art. But I think sometime between, let's just say, 1970 and 1980, they started being called Easter eggs, and that became the word for it, henceforth. Mm. Mm -hmm. Now, and in, I, you know, and software especially, right, games mostly, but also other software was like ripe for having these because in other art forms, there are only so many ways to hide things. Yeah, like um, think about the complexity of printing a record that has a fiddly fucking third track hidden. Like we had one, like my dad had it. It was really yeah, hard to get that middle track to play. Because it, was it was very so hard. Down. I almost didn't believe it was there because I couldn't get it to go in the slot. Um, we had to use the, but, the good turntable. It wouldn't work on my Big Bird one. Yep. Um, but, you know, in other art forms, right, to get Easter eggs in there, 
for them to either be, you know, to be non-obvious, so they're hidden enough that no one notices them, but also they're actually findable without going to extreme lengths, right? You know, something like, ah, oh, yes, if you shine a UV light on this or wear special glasses, the secret message appears. Who knows to do that? No one will yeah. ever see it. I, I feel right? like the best Easter eggs are the ones that are so easy to find or so obvious, yet no one notices them for a long time. Like, mm -hmm. that's the that's the peak Easter egg. That is S-tier Easter egg. Like, once you know about it, it's so obvious you feel stupid. Yeah, like, you know, the sculpture that looks like an op a particular object, but if you look at it from a very specific angle, it lines up and it's a different <laughs> object, right? Or like, you know, there's those drawings, or if you turn them upside out, it's, it's something different, right? Yeah, um, yeah. But software like really gave you a lot of ways to do it. Because one, there's the source code, like... You can have there's Easter eggs in source code, just like there's Easter eggs well, in the well, spectrograms of audio. If people have access to the source code, it makes the Easter eggs too easy to find. Yep. But if you don't have access to the source code, then it's like there's so many places to hide it, right? You could just have it's like ah, and, and but the thing is, once someone knows, it's very easy, right? You just have to type in this keyboard shortcut mm. that no one would ever press these ten keys at the same time on this specific dialog box. That would never happen. But once you know about it, you just do it. There it is, Ooh, right? So and supposedly the first song plays. software Easter egg, even if it wasn't called that, uh, was actually October 1967 on the PDP-6, where uh -huh. if you use the make command and typed make love, it would just respond, not war. And then it would work. Mm. Again, There's also, I think, one of the most famous ones in gaming is... You know, Totaka's song, right? Mm. There's so many Nintendo games that either have it in a hidden or non-hidden fashion. Um, or there are also games that, like, people have, like, dug through the, the data of the games and found the song, but are not necessarily sure, like, if there's actually a way to play it or not, mm. <laughs> legitimately, or if it's just, like, on the disc or on the yep. cartridge, taking up memory. There's, um, there's also edge cases, like, there's the... Uh, the if you play Mario 3, there's the one-up sound, but mm -hmm. there's actually an extended version of that, but it's not accessible via the game. Like, that's not really an Easter egg. It's just an artifact of how the game was programmed because there's no way to access it except via a glitch, and it doesn't appear to have been intentional. Mm -hmm. I, the intentionality is really key. It has to be intentional, and it has to be accessible. Yep. I mean, you know, Mario 3 is a great example because of, like, what's a secret and what's an Easter egg, right? Mm. It's like, is get is ducking down on the white block and then going to get the whistle and then getting a white coin house. It's like, none of that stuff is in the instruction manual, Yep. right? But I'd uh, argue, I, I would call that a secret. I haven't figured out what my right. line is yet, but that's it's, definitely not an Easter egg yeah, to me. It's in the strategy guide. They just tell you about all this stuff, Yeah. right? But it's like, what's an Easter egg and what's a secret? I think the Easter egg... It's like, especially if it's a game, it's like this this functionality to those, right? When mm. you a coin ship is giving you a bunch of coins, right? It's like part of the game somehow, um, even though it was just a hidden part of the game. Like a, a secret in Wolfenstein, you know, oh, open up that door is a warp. There's ammo yeah. in there. There's treasure in there. But Easter eggs is literally just like you know a dev room. I think like in uh, Final Fantasy Four's got I one. I think there's like a dev room. You go, it's just like a room. Oh no! Or System Shock, I think, has a dev room. I don't know. A lot of games. A lot have of games dev have dev rooms where it's just a room. It doesn't do anything. It's just like a space where you know to that where the it's sort of Which out of context. Which actually leads me to a better definition for this part. I think Easter eggs have got to be not contextual to the media itself. Like they are. Well, not... but the Monty Python one is contextual. It's a whole it, right. True, but like the adventure one is a credit appears on a screen like text appears saying hey i made this game that's true yep so maybe the monty python one isn't technically an easter egg my, my, maybe you could argue well, the only thing that bothers me about easter eggs is a lot of people will call things easter eggs that i would say are just references to other media in media like, oh, it's an Easter egg. That's Spider-Man's web shooter. Like, no, that's just a reference to Spider-Man in a Spider-Man movie. Calm down, nerd. Mm. Like, I don't really consider things that are just references in movies and comics to be Easter eggs. The Easter egg would have to be like... Yeah, those are just like cameos or whatever, or homages, right? It actually yeah. has to be like a hidden, like a truly hidden thing, right? There has to be some step you take to like 
reveal it. Yeah, um, like, like you a take magic eye. Page, you take or... page five of the comic and do the Mad Magazine thing in a particular spot, and oh shit, there's a picture of Spider Man, but this is not a Spider Man comic. Like there, Easter egg. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I like them. I like. I like people hiding little treats around. Like, I just think it's a fun thing to do. It hurts no one. Uh, there's a lot of debate as I skim through this Wikipedia article of, are they okay? Are they security risk? Like, there, there's a, people have a lot well, of opinions. Not, uh, so for, uh, are they okay? If you're not hurting anyone, it's okay. Yeah. Come on. That's yeah, the I end, mean, of, at, if, end of discussion. If, if the it's Easter harmful, egg is okay. fascist, it's bad. Like, full stop. Yeah, yeah if you're hiding, like, secret you know, a secret copy of Mein Kampf in your video game, then yes, that's bad. Ooh, the listener raised a question. There are, archi- uh, and a comment, architectural Easter eggs. Like, that's true. Walk through a, the right part of a building and like a thing happens. Step on the brick and King Todd winks at you. Well, uh, things like in Grand Central, it's like you, you whisper into the corner and the people on the other side can hear it. Mm-hmm. Right? Things like that, where it's like, it, that's really more, you know, it's like a hidden feature, right? Where it's like, yeah. It's it's just you know there's something about it, but you just don't you just don't know unless it has been you know it just looks like a normal object, right? This yep. looks just like a room, but actually there's something in this room that you can't see. I still think it, it it's only an Easter egg if it is intentional by the creator and intentionally hidden by the creator. Because I think a key component for me of what when I viscerally feel something is an Easter egg is. When I find it or I find out about it, my first reaction is, ha, wow. Like, I'm surprised and slightly delighted. Like, mm-hmm. like I'm. I, there's always a little bit of excitement. Like, oh, what's this? Ooh. All right. Now, like, imagine if someone had, you know, an old slidey bookshelf with a secret room. Is that an Easter egg? You know, or is, eh. it, is it too far, right? But, for example, I was at Disneyland in November, right? Mm. And we were going through, you know, in uh i don't know how it is i haven't been to disney world this millennium but i remember when i went to disney world as a kid i wanted to go in the castle and that's not really a thing (laughs) Uh, uh, but in disneyland there was something that approached going in the castle basically behind the castle to the left right there was a shop where you could buy princess dresses (laughs) um (laughs) of all the different princesses uh like a fancy dress shop right like you want the high quality costume right and then Next to it was like a little a door, a por- a doorway. And basically it was up a staircase. I don't think this is a very accessible area with the staircase. There was no other way to get in there besides stairs. And it was just a short walkthrough where you went in one side and you came out the other. And you just go in through stairs and it looked like you were in a castle. It was castle inside dungeony themed. Mm-hmm. And it just sort of had little scenes, dioramas just showing you the Sleeping Beauty story because it's Sleeping Beauty's castle in California. And, you know, that that was it, mm-hmm. right? It was just walk through. There's the story of Sleeping Beauty and a few thingies, right? I think and then you walk out the another, other side. Another aspect. All right, but this, the, the Easter egg part was that while I was walking through, right, there was, you know, it was decorated like the inside of a castle, and there was a wooden door, right? Like a decorative, you know, castle dungeony wooden door. And I pulled on the handle... To be like, lol, I'm gonna try to open the, the dungeon door. The door shook and there was a, a la like ah, ha, 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 ha. ha that's good. That might be an Easter right. egg. Right. And so it's like, you know, what it's like it wasn't that hidden because it's like you just opening a door that's a door, it's not hidden. Yeah. Right. But it's like nothing in there would make you think that anything was interactive. It was just a walkthrough. But I think that's so. it too. It has it not only has to be hidden and intentional. They w- they have to want people to find it. If you don't want people to find it, it's not an Easter egg. Mm-hmm. All right, it's a we we're discussing. Actually, there's a lively chat in the on this one uh, <laughs> because this is a hot dog sandwich situation. This is it's actually really hard to define. It is one this of those time. cases where yeah, it's like we could argue about the definition all day. Yeah, and uh, but who really cares, right? Of classifying what is and what is not an Easter egg. The point is, is that when there are things hidden with whimsy and whimsy is you know, a good parameter, joy, yeah. and whimsy, joy, serendipity, right? serendipitous discovery. Yes, those are things that make people 
happy as long as you don't overdo it. So case and in point, imagine before so. anyone, like everyone knew about the third track, like and understood it. Imagine you put your record, you play that record and you play that record. And one day you put the needle down and it happens to hit that other groove you didn't know about. And a record you've listened to before plays something different. Mm -hmm. Imagine what that feels like for 30 seconds before you figure out what's going on. Like that is sublime. That right. moment. That's the key. It doesn't really matter what your definition is, whether it counts as an Easter egg or not, who cares, right? The point is, there are certain things along these lines that can make people feel good, positive, right? Good, right? Mm. We like them. We enjoy them. They make the world nicer for humans to live in when they're experiencing artwork. And that is a good thing. So if you can do a thing like that in your artwork successfully in a, in a positive way that works, um, if someone wants to say it's not an Easter egg or it is or whatever definition who gives a shit, as long as it is achieving the positive ends, uh, we like that a lot. And uh, if anyone has more cool examples, because maybe younger or older than us, and you know better <laughs> or worse than us, uh, share so that we can all have that feeling some more. Yeah.